one thing you must know about me is that I am a married man, which to me is a miraculous fact. <laughs> I never thought that I would be married. Well, I, I, like not in my lifetime. <laughs> Maybe my children, my children's children, they'd see me married. <laughs> but I'm very surprised and very delighted because I was uh, what you would call a late bloomer. It took me a while to get my personal act together because I am from a generation that had more choices than previous generations, and I think that delayed maturing. Like, my father's generation, the greatest generation, he fought in World War II. Here's how old that guy is. He's dead, <laughs> right? That's as old as it gets. His generation, very different, not a lot of choices. Here were the choices that you had. What everybody else was doing, the end. <laughs> it was very simple. If there was a war, you enlisted in it, no questions asked. You came home, you got a job that you hated. Why? Because no one's gonna marry you if you don't have a job. Why get married? So someone will cook for you, sustenance. <laughs> you have children to perpetuate the cycle of misery. You retire at 50, you look like you're 80. <laughs> and over all of everything, from the moment you are born to the day you are laid into the ground, if you have a feeling about something, you just bottle that up. <laughs> you don't say nothing to nobody. Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you. Paul, thanks for being here. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, so much to talk to you about. Uh, congratulations on the, on the special that's premiering this weekend, right? Yes, it is. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night at 11 on Comedy Central. 11 Eastern Pacific, Central, 10 o'clock, Mountain Time, people. You're on your own. <laughs> we also have the list of channel numbers that Comedy Central is in your particular time zone. That's so exactly we'll right. <laughs> yes, indeed. I have all of that knowledge at my fingertips. Please do write to me and ask me what channel it will be on where you live. <laughs> so Paul, how long do you take to uh, craft a special before you're, you know, you're ready to actually shoot it? And how many, how many times did you shoot it? Did you shoot one night, you shoot two nights, cut it together? I shoot, I, I like to do one performance because I think that um, uh, the typical thing is to shoot twice. You'll do an early show and a late show, but everyone at the early show secretly knows it's gonna be the late show is the one that gets used because uh, I don't know, it's just a psychological thing where the performer and the audience all know this is just like a practice thing and it's just there for safety in case something goes horribly wrong at the second show, which it won't. You know, it's modern times. Like if something bad happens, you just stop and you fix it and then you go on. So I like, to, I, I like the immediacy and the energy of just that one show, that one performance. Um, but to put the material together typically takes uh, about, well, my stuff is stories drawn from my life. First, I have to live the things, right? I have to have the life experience. Then I have to uh, sort out which ones are worthy of sharing with another person. Then I put those all together, and then I tore it around. And so this process, because I was doing a lot of things at the same time, probably took uh, longer than usual. It probably took like a couple years to put it all together. Yeah. So when you start building your material, are you looking forward towards a special, or are you just building material as a stand-up and telling your stories? And well, yeah, the, always the idea is that it will be recorded in some fashion. That it's it's this I'm I'm building an hour that is unique to itself. So that this will be this chunk of material that I will do all together at the same time, and then uh, move on to the next chunk of material. So. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's no guarantee that you will get to do a special. Um, I am lucky that somebody, you know, wanted to give me a bunch of money to do a special. Um, but, uh, it, you know, the idea is that it will be recorded in some fashion for posterity and hopefully for sale um, <laughs> at some point. Did you have any um, sort of hard bombs when you were first working out the material, when you first started uh, digging through? No, I mean, I, I uh, you're you never, sort of you're at a point now where you can kind of make it through early material without a kind of. Yeah, I mean, you, you, uh, you never are uh, immune to bombing. You can be doing this forever and still have a bad show. But uh, working out material is always difficult because it's not all there yet. And you, 
um, you know, you have to go out uh, and figure out what works and what doesn't. So um, I never, it wouldn't be a case of like <laughs> going out there and getting zero laughs across the board, but it, it is like you go out there with a chunk of stuff and you have to just whittle it down, whittle it down, whittle it down. And the way you whittle it down is, well, no one has laughed at that and I've done it 12 times. So that has to go, um, this part stays in because people always laugh at that. But the, the, the challenge always is, uh, I have this idea in my head that I think is very funny. I need to translate it into ordinary speech so that strangers can understand it who are not living inside my head. That's always the challenge. So the heartbreak is sometimes there are ideas that will make you laugh, but you're never able to fully communicate why it's funny to another group of people. By the time you get to a special, um, have, are you basically going off of memory word for word, or are you kind of still riffing a little bit along the lines of the ideas that you have? The idea, ideally, what, what I get to is I know the material cold, um, and there's a lot of it that, it, most of it is word for word, but leaving room, uh, knowing, knowing it so well and leaving room for uh, uh, spontaneity so that if an idea occurs to me, I can throw that in there. Um, and that happened with this special, like up to the last day, uh, up to the day I was recording, uh, there was a thing that I said, I can't remember what it was now, but there was a, 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 ta a tag I gave to a joke that I had never said any, of the, any time I'd ever done the material. And it got a big laugh, and I was like, I'm glad that that can still happen. You talk about being a late bloomer just in the clip that we saw. You're, uh, you know, you're, you're a very good dresser. Just very dapper, right? You always Thank you. bow ties, <laughs> ties. I'm wondering. Thank uh, you. I, I'm wondering if that came when you when you got your shit together after you you had bloomed a little bit. No, I, I that had always been a part of my life, and sort probably <laughs> it probably led people to believe that I had it more together than I did. But <laughs> I I always liked to dress up. I went to. I mean, ever since I was a kid, I always liked to put on outfits and stuff because I wanted to be in show business, you know. So it was like costumes and stuff. And then when I went to I went to Catholic school, and uh, uh, my Catholic high school, you had to the boys had to wear a coat and tie, and so that's kind of when I really got into clothes um, because I was I was forced to. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a really big time for you right now. You have not just this stand up special. You have your podcast, the Pod F Tomcast, right? That actually, that's my previous. Oh, podcast. previous podcast. Excuse me. Right now, I have Dead a new one that I'm doing called Spontaneous Nation. Spontaneous Nation, which is the, the a, a, a sort of the other end of the spectrum from the Pod F Tomcast, which was a thing that was very produced and a lot of pre and post production. And Spontaneous Nation is completely improvised. It all lives in the moment that it gets recorded. Uh, so it's it's kind of, you know, I I, I tend to um, do things for a while and then I get. Once it becomes to feel like once it comes to feel like a template, I kind of get tired of it, um, and so I need to do another thing to to keep myself interested. So, is it are you more comfortable doing something spontaneous like this, or did you prefer the over the produced version? I like the result of the produced version, but it's a lot of work. It's it's a lot of um, to achieve certain things. Like I was doing this running sketch where I did all the voices. I was doing different uh, you know impressions of people, and so. I had to record those separately, then edit them together, and, uh, and it was all scored with music and sound effects and things like that. And that's very satisfying when you hear it, but uh, to put it together was just more work than I could handle eventually. For a while, it was great, and I loved it. And then after a while, I just realized this is, this is starting to feel like a job, which it was never supposed to feel like. And now, um, now I'm actually getting paid to do a podcast, which I've made <laughs> not feel like a job at all, um, which is... Uh, uh, over the over the last handful of years, I have been uh, educated in improv just through osmosis, really. From uh, podcasting is a big part of that of doing characters and and having to sustain um, a scene or an idea or a or, or a concept with people uh, all in the moment, and uh, having access to uh, like the UCB Theater in in Los Angeles and and all those great people. Um, it just got me more and more into that world. Uh, and so when it came time to do a new podcast, and Earwolf, the, the podcast network, asked me if I wanted to do something, and I said, yeah, you know what, I want to do an improv thing. I want to do something where I can just show up, it lives all in that moment, and then it goes out warts and all. So no editing, no post-production, and, you know, something, you know, the, 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 the idea of improv, uh, to me, has been very helpful because the, a big part of the ethos of it is uh, 
you try. You go out, you try. You're not always going to succeed. Uh, the idea is you'll succeed more than you won't, but you can still throw out an idea that won't go anywhere. But you have to learn to move on from that, stay in the moment, and, uh, and maybe the next thing will be better. But you can't dwell on things that didn't work. You have to keep moving forward. And that was a big lesson for me. So this was kind of, would you say that this is almost like a necessary osmosis? Have you ever found yourself in a time where you couldn't move forward from something that may not have worked out the way that you wanted it to? Oh, I'm, I'm somebody that dwells on things. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I have a really hard time. I really have a hard time other than on stage being present. I'm always thinking about the past and I'm thinking about the future. And it's, it's, a, it's gotten to the point where you know, at this point, I have a really nice life, and I have to, like, sometimes out loud say to myself, you have a nice life, you know, that I, I you know, I'm lucky enough to have a good marriage, and, and I have a good job, and I have good friends, and um, that's really all you need, you know, and I have to, I have to remind myself to stop thinking about things that didn't work out before and stop worrying about whether or not other things are going to work out in the future, but it's, uh, it's always been, that's always been a difficult thing for me. Where do you normally say that to yourself? Um, like, like physically or yeah, when? Out loud, like, out loud, like where? I imagine if you're in proximity to people who don't know what's going on, it could be kind of awkward. They don't know if <laughs> they're being complimented no, or if they realize that you're saying it to yourself, they're kind of annoyed at you. They're like, this yeah, is, fine. No, this is more of a me, me by myself in the car kind of thing. This is not like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not just like in a restaurant or something, yeah. <laughs> and then people are are confused and afraid. <laughs> um, you you also have this show on 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 fusion. I've been I've been hearing that you're with the show. You're planning on tackling the election this year. Yeah. With uh, you and puppets. Yes, it's called No You Shut Up. It is it's very funny. It's a very funny. Thank show you. On fusion. We're, yeah. we're going into our fourth season, and uh, the idea of the show is it's a it's a current affairs discussion show, like a meet the press kind of thing. And I host it, and the panelists are puppets from the Henson Company. Um, and it started as a sort of 15-minute one-joke show, and then we uh, got expanded to a half hour, and it's become a lot more than that. And uh, it's a really uh, crazy and creative show that I, I am very happy to be a part of. It, it was this thing that just kind of happened. You know, I was asked, do you want to do this? And... I said sure, and then um, it ended up being a job. You know, I, I didn't. I was surprised that it happened at all, much less continued to happen. But uh, are you are you handling the writing on it as well? Um, but yeah, this year I will be one of the executive producers, and I'm in the office every day with the writers, and we're putting the show together uh, uh, as a team. And um, I am uh, I'm really excited about it. It's a, it's a good group of people. We're it's a very small staff. I mean, Fusion is a new network, and they don't have a ton of money to spread around all over the place, and even though they have given us a big order, like one of the, I think one of the bigger orders they've given any show on their network, um, we're still a very, like a skeleton crew there, and so we're, we're handling a lot, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a really talented group. What's your take on uh, the election right now? What's, what's going on with the election? I don't how, know do why, want, how do you want why are to we cover talking it? talking about it? Why are we talking about it now? It's absurd. And yeah. one of the things that we want to talk about on the show is uh, not just the electoral process, but how absurd the media is in the way they they handle uh, elections. And that I, this is, I, you know, they want ratings. Look, we want ratings too. They want ratings. I think there's something that's um, that's kind of uh, terrible about what a uh, a TV show they make out of this process because. It's very important, and it, it needs to get better. The system is broken, and it needs to be fixed, and I don't think that our media is helping us out with that very much. I saw a CNN reporter this morning in a car with Martin O'Malley, a Democratic nominee, or not the nominee, but running for the Democratic nomination, recreating fear and loathing in Las Vegas. They were in a red convertible, and the man who was running for president was recreating scenes from a, Hunter S. Tom a movie based on a Hunter S. Thompson novel. Like... We're, no sense of irony whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It, I don't know, I don't know who that serves, and <laughs> I don't know how that, I don't know how that helps Martin O'Malley. I don't know how, it certainly doesn't don't help think it does. voters, you know, yeah. I, I, unless it's like a process of elimination, like, well, I'm not going to vote for the guy that did that, <laughs> for sure. That's a mistake. I'm not in politics, and I can tell you, you should not have done that. Um, can we talk about BoJack Horseman? Sure we Mr. can. Mr. Peanut Butter, uh, that show is... 
so great, and it only gets better with every episode of the season. I remember seeing the first episode of the first season being like, oh, I like this. Mm -hmm. And then as that season progressed, I liked it more, and then the second season was just phenomenal. It's yeah. so great. What is, your, what is your role in that show? Is it just simply playing Mr. Peanut Butter? And I, yeah, I just show up, and I, I voice a, uh, a, a Labrador retriever, and... Uh, or is he a golden retriever? I, what is the? Does anyone know the difference? There can't be a difference, right? Labrador retriever and golden retriever, are because la Labradors are different colors. I think it's just colored gold, golden colored, and, and like and, and brown colored or black. Colored. You got a chocolate lab, of course. That's brown colored. Yeah. Sounds delicious. Yeah, you're right. Then uh, a golden retriever, but then are all golden retrievers black Labrador labs. retrievers? <laughs> Look, we're never going to settle this here. <laughs> I play a yellow dog. <laughs> What's the name of the show that your yellow dog character hosts? It's it's the oh, it's the see. greatest show title. It's let so me good. see if I if I <laughs> if I can get it. Hollywood stars and celebrities. I'm sorry, Hollywood stars and celebrities. What do they know? Do they know things? Let's find out. I you believe missed, that is the title. Missed, of the show. I'm sorry, you missed one key part of the title. What is it? J.D. Salinger's <laughs> Hollywood stars. Right. What do they know? That's do right. they know things? He's the producer, the creator or producer of that show. What did you think when you saw when you got that line on paper that you to to read that? Oh well, by that point, I mean that was so far into the show uh, that I was ready for anything. I mean, the first, as you say, like the the first couple episodes of season one of that show, I think uh, a lot of critics wrote it off. Because they didn't keep watching. I think they watched a couple episodes and like, I get this. It's a cartoon for grown-ups, and you know, there's like adult situations, and they're making fun of celebrities or whatever. But if if you keep watching it, it becomes this uh, weird uh, dramedy where there's some heavy emotional stuff in it, which only continues into season two. And I think season two, I think reviewers went back and watched the rest of season one. Um, it's a really strange project. I'm very glad to be a part of it. Uh, uh, but it was even I didn't know I didn't know where it was headed. I I was asked if I wanted to do this, and I said sure, and uh, you know read the first script, and I was like, oh okay, this is one of these shows. Second script, yeah okay, this is fine. Then the third script, I think, is when it really started to get into heavy territory, and I was like, oh this is interesting. And then uh, I was watching the the season unfold at the table reads. We would all that's the only time we're all together, the cast. We would so read the through the script. The cast actually does get together for table reads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We read loud. it all out loud for the first time together, and then everyone records separately. Um, but uh, but at those table reads, we get a chance to. It's really fun for me because we get a chance to do those dramatic moments, you know, at least once all together, um, which is not something I get to do a lot. Uh, but uh, I I from week to week, I was discovering the show the same way anyone who would watch it is discovering it, like, oh, what's happening now? <laughs> like, this episode ended very sadly. Why is this happening? It was, uh, it was quite a journey. And so going into season two, I was uh, so excited to see where they take the characters. Now we're recording season three. Oh, I can't wait. And you said that you rarely get to do dramatic moments, but you have done a dramatic scene before <laughs> somewhat, and no person is allowed to come on a stage with me and not tell stories of working on a Paul Thomas Anderson film that they worked on. <laughs> sure. You had a small part in There Will Be Blood. Yes. Uh, where you played uh, alongside Daniel Day-Lewis. That's right. What was that like, going from what you had been doing, stand-up or improv, to being next to Daniel Day-Lewis? It was totally unlike anything. I mean, I had done... This was my, my second PTA joint. I had uh, been shot for Magnolia, but my face was cut out of it. You can still hear my voice on the phone. There's a scene where... Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman is on the phone. He's trying to find Tom Cruise. Right. So he calls this, uh, you know, the disgusting um, company that Tom Cruise has and gets me on the phone. Are you one of the assistants? I remember Mary, Mary Lynn Rajkowski. Yeah, Mary Lynn you can still see yeah. in the show, in, in the movie. Um, but me you don't see. I'm just a call center guy. And he talks to me and we talk about, uh, uh, you know, he's taking care of someone with cancer. And I say my mom had cancer. And, you know, so that was, that was probably my first big dramatic thing. Um, it's huge. It's a, it's a, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's it's crazy that I was even close to that movie. It's crazy I saw that movie. <laughs> so then uh, when Paul showed up uh, uh, to a gig I was doing to tell me in person that he was cutting me out of Magnolia, <laughs> and he said, but I'll make it up to you. And then years later, he just put me in There Will Be Blood in this scene where you can't even tell it's me unless you're really, really looking. Um, and I have 
just this brief moment with Daniel Day-Lewis, which was, you know, absolutely thrilling to be, like, in the same... To, to be, like, standing a foot away from this amazing actor was tremendous. What a strange, weird, and fun thing that I got to do. Did you, know? you dare say hi to the man that was in character? I, I was introduced to him before we shot, and he was kind of in character, and he said hello uh, as the character, and... Uh, and then um, uh, we did not. What's that do to you when you meet someone who's in? It's that? crazy. Are you just like, oh shit! It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, because he's, you know, he's a tall guy and he's very imposing and and you know he's really intense and and being on the set with him, um, you know, he was just sitting in this chair and just like so intense, like just to be around him and watch him in the downtime where he was clearly just focused the whole time, like he didn't want to lose his thing. Does you know? Paul warn you at all? Does he let you, like? Oh, no one needs to warn you. Like, it's apparent right away. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think, I, I mean, because he was never, he never said, call me Mr. Plainview or anything like that. Like, he just kind of stays in the voice to stay in, and that's his thing. I don't know if he, I, I heard some story where he was, you know, he and Sally Field were, like, sending each other texts in character when they were working on Lincoln. And it's like, okay, but you know that happens on a phone, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think he's, I think he is an intense guy who's clearly dedicated to what he's doing, but I don't think he is, goes so far afield that he, he's gonna, I'm pretending I'm a different person all the time, you know. I think he does certain things to keep him where he needs to be. So, uh, you do this scene with him, you're not just sitting next to him, you do chase him out of the, out of the place, <laughs> right? right. Were, yeah. you, uh, were you nervous doing, scene, doing scenes with him, or did you just sort of feel like you could do your thing and it'd be okay? I was, I mean, the nervousness overall was, I hope I'm doing a good job at this, you know, because this is, uh, this is a big deal. It's, you know, this is, uh, you know, somebody who, a filmmaker that I really respect, and I'm, this is, this is a real gift to be asked to be a, a part of this in a teeny tiny way, and I just want to make sure that I would hate for him, I wouldn't want him to regret asking me to do this small thing, and like, ev like screening the movie and like, I wish I'd gotten somebody else to do that one line, you know. Never cast in a friend again. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But it was, uh, I, I got past the nervousness. I mean, it's one of those things where you have to kind of say to yourself, as long as nobody tells me I'm doing a bad job, then I must be doing okay. That, and that's, uh, that's a lot of directors will only give you a note if there's a problem. And so you have to sort of self-soothe and you have to say like, well, no news is good news and I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing and my job is to, is to give this performance and if there needs to be an adjustment, I will be given the adjustment and I will make that adjustment. Um, but of course, it's, it's, you know, it's like you have to calm yourself down. So I did get to the point where like, it was so absurd to me that I was even there at all that it, then it just became fun. Like, just that idea that I shouldn't be here. This should be somebody's, like, a real actor should be here doing this. <laughs> um, I don't want to run down, uh, you know, a list of all the things that you've done or anything like that, but you do have, also coming out now, uh, Bob and David. Yes, with Bob and David. With Bob and David, uh, yeah. Which will be on Netflix next month. And uh, Next month? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> what? I'm That's glad amazing. I, I'm glad I could provide this scoop. New Mr. Show is coming next month. <laughs> 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 That's right. You literally just blew my mind. That wasn't for a fact. When did, you, was... when did you think it was going to happen? I thought it was coming out like next year. No. Well, we shot it. I mean, you know, it's, we shot four episodes of a, of a sketch show. Are there screeners yet? I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> there might be, actually. Um, but, yeah, we, we shot. It was, uh, uh, was going to be the 20th anniversary this year of Mr. Show, of, of the first season of Mr. Show. And... Um, Bob and David wanted to do something. So last year, they wrote to all the writers and said, hey, let's get together and read through some unproduced sketches and, and see what we like. And um, we want to do something. We don't know what we want to do. Like, there was no offer from anybody. It was just, it would be really great to do something to kind of celebrate um, that we did this in the first place. And um, so we all got together and uh, read through some scripts. And it was great because, uh, you know, that show... It had been so long, it had been, you know, 20 years since we first did it, and um, uh, it, was, it was nothing but fun because nobody had, everyone had, had matured in the meantime, and people had settled down, got married, had kids, you know, all that. So nobody had the anxiety that we had the first time around, where for some of us, it was our first big job, 
And, you know, for me, I remember just thinking every day I'm going to get fired, you know. And so to to have had my own career and accomplish my own things and um, had my own peaks and valleys and everything uh, made it just so much more enjoyable than it was the first time around. It's not like the first time around it was terrible, but there was a lot of, you know, nervous energy that accompanied that. Um, and this time it was just fun. Why did you think you were going to get fired all the time? Because I, it was a brand new experience, you know, and, and I, I was a fan of that show before I got hired for it because I had seen Bob and David do these live shows around Los Angeles that became uh, Mr. Show on HBO. And so uh, everyone knew, we were all aware that these guys were doing something special and, and, uh, and unique and, and exciting. And then to be asked to be a part of it was like, oh man, I don't want to be the one that screws this up. I want to be, I want to be worthy of this. Uh, because I admire it so much, and you know, and it's hard. It, it's a hard lesson to learn. the The rejection of a of a writing room is that sometimes you're going to pitch things. It's like the the lesson of improv. You're going to pitch things, and it's not going to go well. And that's part of the job. Is that you can't. You're not going to hit a home run every single time. Not every idea that you express is going to be. You've done it again. I don't know how you keep doing it, but this is perfect. Let's just shoot it now, you know? So there were a lot of pitches that didn't go anywhere. There was a lot of things that, you know, it was like, go back and work on that. There was some things that were like, we love this. Let's, let's proceed. But um, it's, um, you know, it's a lot of up and down, you know, and you have to learn how to roll with it um, and, and be okay with that. Absolutely. I think we have time for audience questions. Hey, Paul. Hi there. You're awesome. <laughs> Thank um, you. I just want to know who are like some of your biggest influences, comedic or not, just in general that you still look to or you know go, wow, that was or this or that. Yeah, um, like when I was a kid, I remember listening to uh, my parents' Bob Newhart albums. They have the '60s Bob Newhart albums, and I thought, and I remember hearing them as a kid and really loving them. And I loved his TV shows. And then uh, years and years later, I got those same albums uh, on iTunes and listened to them for the first time in decades since I was a child. And I could not believe how well they held up. Like, he was doing his own thing, like doing one-man sketch, essentially. And no one's really done that thing as good as he did. And, uh, and it was pretty amazing. And then I, there are people that inspire me now that are people that started after me. Like somebody like Lauren Lapkus, who I think is absolutely uh, tremendous. And I, I am... Uh, she not only makes me laugh, but I love that the conceit of her show, she has a podcast where uh, it's her and one other person, and the other person decides who she is going to be, and then they improvise for an hour. And the, the fearlessness of that um, uh, is, is really inspiring to me. Next question. Oh, hi, Paul. Um, I saw you last night in improv, and it was very good. It was my first time doing improv, and that was fun to watch. Um, I was wondering, well, um, on the Dead Authors podcast, since it's not going to keep going. Um, if you could have had any author on, what author would you like to have on? Oh, you know, there were so many people that, we, uh, that I wanted to have on, and then I remembered that they were not dead. <laughs> the conceit of the show was, uh, it was a podcast where I played H.G. Wells, and I have a time machine, and so I transport uh, uh, authors who are now dead from their own time to the present. It, the title was terrible because people thought that they were you know, reanimated dead people. And it's like, no. And then the, the, it was confusing for the people who were playing the authors because they were like, wait, so do I know I'm dead? It's like, no, you're not, you, you're not dead at all. Um, but like Harper Lee was one. I kept thinking about like, oh, maybe somebody should do Harper Lee. I, it would be like once a year I would have that thought and then realize, but well, she's still not dead. Um, you know, a, a big one would have been, uh, uh, and someday we'll do this, Jules Verne would be great to have on. Um, because we had built in this rivalry between H.G. Wells and, and Jules Verne that we that we never did. But there were there were a bunch of people, because I had a long list that I would give to potential guests, um, like Shakespeare. Nobody ever picked Shakespeare. Uh, Why do you uh, think that is? Do you think people are scared to do Shakespeare? I don't know. I don't know if they assume somebody else has done it, or I don't know why. I don't know if it seems too easy or too obvious. Yeah, that's what I, I, yeah, that's, uh, what they, oh, I don't want to start doing the, yeah. you know, pandemic. It'd like, be a great one to do, though. Yeah. But, yeah, <laughs> there's, a, there's a number of people that, uh, that we, I, I'm surprised we never got around to. Next question. Hi, Paul. Um, a moment ago, you talked about some of your comedic inspirations, but I was wondering who is the funniest person you know personally? The funniest person I know personally is my wife. 
She cracks me up. We laugh a lot together. And she will, she just has a, a, an energy and a surprising thought process. She'll come out with a turn of phrase that I did not see coming. For me, the thing that makes me laugh more than anything is surprise. If somebody says, a, says an unexpected, says or does an unexpected thing, um, that is absolutely my favorite. That's one of the reasons I love Lauren so much is because she comes out with such crazy stuff. But yeah, my wife, I, I, I know that sounds terribly corny, but it really is true. I mean, she, it's one of the reasons I married her. She really, really makes me laugh. Time for our last question from an online viewer. What? <laughs> Madison would like to know, why do you think podcasts are such a great medium for comedy? I think because, uh, I think podcasts are a great medium for comedy because it's, it's the, the theater of the mind thing. You can, um, you can go anywhere, you can do anything. You can just say, we are in this medieval castle. You can say, we are in the far future. You can, you can do whatever. And, um, and the audience goes along with you. I think it's a great, it's also, because it's a very democratic medium, anyone can do it. Uh, it's, it's a thing, especially for, for creative, funny people, to have the middleman cut out. Uh, they don't have to ask anyone, can I have this space? Can I uh, uh, you know, do a show in this, in this place? They can just do it in their own bedroom, in their garage, at their kitchen table, whatever, and put it out there. And um, it gives you so much freedom that uh, you can just be as creative as, uh, as, you, as you want to be. Um, I, I, think it's a, I hope it always stays as democratic as it is. I hope it always will be that um, the, the, the people have the means of, of production and distribution. You know? It would be a sad thing if that were to go away. Do you have more podcasts in you? Are you going to keep coming up with new ideas and new shows? I, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I'm really enjoying Spontaneity Nation right now. I'm having a lot of fun doing that. Um, I want to continue to do that. We do live versions of the show once a month um, in Los Angeles. And uh, I, I absolutely love doing that. But I'm, I'm open to the idea that I might get tired of it eventually and need to do something else. And then I hope people will come along for that, whatever that is. I'm sure they will. Paul, thank you so much for being here, Thank man. you. My pleasure. Check out the Thanks, Comedy everybody. Special tomorrow night thank on you. Comedy Central. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Good pleasure. Thanks so much.